Mother's Day to you all. I've had the privilege of uh, speaking the past few couple of Mother's Days and, and share just some, some great reminders of how important and how beloved women are in the Scripture. How, uh, you know, the, the, the first Jesus did was at the request of a woman. Uh, and the first to see Him risen was, were women. Um, uh, the two times He raised someone from the dead was at the request of women. So women are highly favored by God. And, and I'm so uh, glad to be here on this occasion and to wish you all a very happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Uh, this year, as we get an opportunity to meet uh, on the second Sunday of every month, uh, we're, speak, we're going through the book of Ephesians. And so we're actually in our fifth of 12 lessons on the six chapters of Ephesians. And today we're going to talk about mystery. The biggest word, the, the word that appears more, most in this passage here in Ephesians 3 is mystery. And here at outset, I want us to know that we're not talking about just any ministry. Mi mi mystery. We're talking about the mystery of God's work in the world. And uh, we're going to see that, that word appear probably four or five times here in this passage. And uh, as I said, we're in chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians was written by Paul, authored by God, for the people, the, the believers there in the city of Ephesus. Now, how do we get to Ephesus? Well, where it is now doesn't exist today. But uh, if we were to start on the mouth of the Mediterranean in Spain and kind of uh, land hop from, from, east to, from west to east, uh -huh. we go from Spain, jump over, and now we find ourselves in Italy. We jump over the next minute slow, we find ourselves in, in the Greek islands. And if we go one more time, we find ourselves on the south eastern end of Europe on the coast where uh, the city of Ephesus is. And just to remind us again, if we're in the city of Ephesus, it's a port town. If we look east at, at, the, at the Mediterranean, we're going to see most closely to us the Greek islands. And so that's the Aegean Sea, uh, all those... Uh, all those Greek uh, stories and myths and all those come from that part of the world uh, there in the Aegean Sea. And so this was a very uh, important town, a very well-known town in the Greek world. Uh, they were also a center for uh, learning and culture and, and specifically, probably most noted, for their religious uh, centrality for uh, false worship of uh, the goddess Diana or Artemis, depending on what language you're using. And... Um, Actually, the temple to her was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, roughly the size of an indoor football field, 160, 60-foot uh, yeah. tall columns, six feet wide at the base. And so uh, God used uh, this book and the person of Paul, the world's first missionary, a traveling evangelist, and, and starter of new churches to come to this area and start this church. And as a result, that religion would dissipate, that, that false religion and uh, we eventually uh, disappear as Christianity rose there, and uh, eventually that town itself would also disappear. Um, but this is in the city of Ephesus, and the occasion, or the, the purpose of the, of the writing was the believers there in Ephesus, the city of Ephesus. They had believers there that could not get along. Can you imagine that? Cannot get along. And so for them, and for us, God had this book written to teach us how to get along. And it's more than just... Uh, uh, simple do's and don'ts like, you know, on the trip, how to get along is usually stop touching her, stop touching him. You know, at the dinner table, it's talk nice to your brother and sister. Stay out of your brother's room. Stop doing that. Well, those are good kind of directions, but we're going to see more of a the big picture idea of why and how we need to practice getting along better with with our brothers and sisters. And just as a review, we learned in chapter 1 how God has blessed us in every spiritual blessing. In other words, the salvation we have is what God gives. It's not what we earned ourselves. In the second chapter, we say, you first, you're saved by grace. Uh, not of anything you do is a gift of God. And so God gives salvation. But not only that, in the second chapter we see, as He tells us, God was wanting to bring two, make two into one, because here in Ephesus you had Christian, uh, people who followed Jesus who were Jewish, and people who followed Jesus who were non-Jewish, and they couldn't get along. And so he said he was making two one, and he also talked about one hope, uh, one spirit. And, uh, and so God not only saves us, He gives salvation, God only also gathers His people. But then our lesson when we get to chapter 3 is the big one. It's the one that really is going to ground our understanding of how to live right with others. Because you see, if we live on just our salvation, we might kick back and think, well, I'm saved, I'm good, I'm done. 
then we might not be mindful of doing other things for the Lord. Or if we're maybe too, uh, too much tunnel vision on uh, the, the family that God has gathered us, because God gives salvation and gathers His people, and we might be too uh, narrowly focused on our church or our home and not seeing the other believers and the other non-believers that need us still to work in them. And so this third idea is central. God not only gives salvation, God not only draw, uh, gathers His people, but He glorifies Himself in lifting His people up so that they may glorify Him. I'll say that again. God glorifies Himself when He lifts His people up so that they may glorify Him. So what does that mean for us? Well, historically, Christians have always said the chief role of mankind is to glorify God. And so that grounds everything we do. If, if we don't like each other, but we realize we need to glorify God, then we can get along. If we think there's something that just is unresolvable, and we get out of our own apprehensions, and look at it as something we can do to glorify God, then we can start to grow. And that growth is really what God wants. And so, and so the three things we see is God, glorify, uh, God gives salvation to His people, God gathers His people, and God glorifies Himself through His people. And just the last thing on Mother's Day, that kind of reminds me of Mother's Day. Mothers, they're always giving of themselves for others, right? And sometimes the one that gathers, that gives the hug, or the holds the family together, is mother. And then last of all, the one who's given up everything so they can lift their child up to glorify their kids. And kids, we all know when you live right, you're either going to honor your family, glorify your family. And, and so it, it's the same idea that we see God's ways are not only good and right, they're also the model for everything we do and all the relationships we have, even for the great mothers that we have. Well, like I said, this lesson is going to teach us about getting everything right by not getting stuck in our salvation, not getting too narrow focused in, uh, in, in our small fellowship or our homes, but being mindful that God wants us to be used to glorify Him. Paul's going to show that to us in 3P, uh, 3 and 3 is what's going to show that for us. 3 P's and another 3 P's. So it's kind of six things, and sometimes it's easier to say two sets of three. So the first thing we're going to see, how can we become people who will glorify God and have a heart and mind to stay centered on glorifying God and not slip away from that way of living, is one, our posture. What is our posture and how we live our lives? Chapter 1, uh, uh, verse 1 of chapter 3 starts off as we get to see Paul's pasture, uh, posture I'm sorry, for the people he's writing to. Verse 1 in chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus... For the sake of you Gentiles. Paul regards himself as a prisoner. If we look down in verse 7, we see him kind of continue, I become a servant. So he sees himself as a prisoner or a servant for the Gentile people, the non-Jewish people, on behalf of God. As we mentioned earlier, his job is that first job of sharing the gospel with people around the world. He was the first one, the first missionary, the first church planner. Do we have a posture like Paul? Do we see ourselves as servants for others on behalf of God? You know, you might ask, well, this is Paul and he had that job to do. And if I understand that perspective, if we think back in, in, in the Gospels, we think of a verse that tell, where Jesus told His disciples, whoever wants to be first must be last. He must be what? A servant to all. And again, you might say, well, here, you know, those are the disciples. They're expected to hold up a different standard. Well, my last call to you to, to, to convince you that our posture, no matter who we are in Christ, should always be of servitude, is to see Paul's example in the letter. How he portrays himself in the letter and how he teaches in the letter of what's expected of us. So do we have a proper posture, a humble posture, to be used by God so we can glorify God? Because that's the ultimate that's the ultimate reason for all that we do, to glorify God. And that's what we have to stay in and remain in. How do we do that? First, with posture. But second, with our passion. Isn't it important to have a passion in life? So many people, so many times, lose passion. We see famous people uh, go through trouble, go through retirement, and come back from retirement because they have their passion, they lost their passion. They have their passion, they lost their passion. Well, we have a passion. Or maybe I should say we have the passion. The passion of all passions that should never grow cold. And that's the passion we have for the message of God. And we see that 
And Paul, as we look in verse 2, Paul says, Surely, talking to the Gentile, uh, talking to the, uh, the believers here, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace. What's grace? The favor of God that we don't deserve. What's administration? How do you manage giving stuff out? So, he says, Surely you have heard of how I am used to give out the message of God. That was Paul's job. That was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. There's the word mystery. Isn't that word mystery important? It's tied to passion. You know, we as people want to solve problems. We want to collect the data, put the dots together, figure it all out, all the puzzles, all the problems, all the riddles. And so that desire, that mystery, what God's about in the world, gives us our passion. You and I have a passion for what God is doing. We say, God, where are you today? How do I get close to that? And how do I live that out in my life? That's the passion, the mystery that others don't know. Our passion as believers to know that is the focus we have. That's the passion we should have. In reading this, because Paul is reading about it, in reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to man in other generations as it has been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles. The Spirit of God to God's holy apostles and prophets. This message that we have, the passion, a passion for the Gospel and sharing the Gospel, is something that has not always been around. If we go back in this time, we're talking about soon after Jesus' death. Before that, we have Jewish people who have walked with God in the Old Testament. But they haven't got the, the right understanding. They haven't got the right passion. Because they believe, you know, this Messiah, this uh, Christ is going to be an anointed deliverer. He's going to deliver them, they think, to political prominence. That their kingdom is going to be strong and powerful. And it's not really got anything to do with any other kingdom. They forgot the Old Testament passage when God told Abraham with the promise, I am going to bless all the world through your seed. And they took it for themselves. That's what we can't do. We have to remember we're for glorifying God. Not to get stuck in the fact that God gives us salvation. And remember those three G's. God gives salvation, but we've got, to be, we've got to know more than that. We've got to remember God gathers His people into one people. And God glorifies Himself. And we've got to live in that glorified. Knowing that God's going to use us to glorify Himself. By one, having a humble posture. By two, having a passion for the gospel. And three, understanding the privilege we have. Because that message was not always around. But today, as he's talking to these people, they know what that mystery is. Well, what is that mystery? Verse 5 tells us, which was not made known to men in generations as it was, has been revealed by the Spirit of God in the, through the apostles and the prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel members together of one body and shares together in the promise of Christ. The Gentiles were left in. Remember we talked about how the Jewish understanding was wrong? We have the right understanding. Jesus came to save all people. And that even, remember he's talking to Gentiles, Ephesians, even you as a non-Jewish person can be an heir of the things of God. Can be a member of the body of God. And can partake in the promise of of God. That's the part we play. That's the part we do. We have a posture of humility. We have a passion for the gospel. We have a part to play as we share with others. We're reminded of that again when Paul says in verse 7, I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the work of His power. Isn't it interesting that this phrase, the gift of God's grace given to me, is not associated here with salvation. The gift of God's grace given to me, Paul puts here as where he got his position of servitude. In other words, along with his salvation came his position in the family of God, which was one of serve one another. And we've heard that. That's why that call is also to us. Serve one another. In other words, we're saved 
not just to be saved, not just to be in the family, but we're saved, remember, always and only, to glorify God. Paul was saved to glorify God. We are saved to glorify God. That's the part we play. Reading on it says, Although I am less than the least of these, of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach the Gentile, to the Gentiles the unsearchable richness of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. So the part we play in sharing that gospel that is our passion is that we share so that people may hear it. It says to, pro to preach the gospel. That word means to just proclaim, to let it be known out there. But to have a little more care because it says not just to preach it, but to make it plainly known. You know, if we've shared Jesus just to put it out there, we haven't shared enough. Because our job is also to make it plainly known. Make it available to folks. Care and live caringly with them so the gospel is understandable. That's our part to play. Why is that important? Why do we need to stay humble? Why do we need to have a passion for Christ, understanding the privilege of this time that we have to share the gospel? And why do we need to take part? Here's the most important part of why glorifying God is not a suggestion, not a hopefully one they can get to, but an expected command of God or an expected responsibility as believer. It says in verse 10, His intent, God's intent, was that now, through the church, this is the first time we've heard church here in the passage, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, the multi-layered, amazing, great fullness of the knowledge of God, should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in, in the heavenly realm. May know to who? The rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. To the evil... We've seen that phrase before. It appears later in a well-known verse in Ephesians. To the evil entities around us. It is God's expectation that His church would speak God's truth to evil around us. Very interesting. It doesn't say that it is speak to the believers. Why not? Well, He's already said our, our position is to share. But also because when we speak goodness and truth that expels the darkness, then that's going to draw people as well. So when we share, we're telling people about Christ. When we live right, we're living right in the face of the evil, and God will use that to glorify Himself. And the most important catch here is the very next phrase. This is in accordance to His eternal purpose, which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is connecting the responsibility or His expectation that the church will live in a way that speaks of God's glory before evil compared to the glory of what He's done in Christ. I'll say that again. God expects the church living right and showing God's glory in the midst of evil. He expects that to coincide with the glory of God and all He did in Jesus. He's going to put us on this place. We're the proof of all He is. We are the one that He is lifting us so that we can glorify Himself. That's why we can't just remember that God gave salvation to us. We can't just remember also that He gathers us up as His children. We must remember that His ultimate meaning is to glorify Himself through us. And just like Paul, that, that gets us ready not to just take salvation, but to take our role to be part of the church, to dispel evil by living right. That's a big deal, but it becomes possible in the next phrase. In Him, through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. How can we do so much? How can we maintain a posture? How can we love and always want to share the gospel? How can we live that hard life of, of in the midst of darkness, living right? I mean, we weren't perfect when we came to Christ. We're not perfect now. How can we do all that? Because this verse says, in Him and through faith in Him, we approach God with freedom and confidence. The answer is, we have access to God. You know, if the game is hard, guess what? You can talk to the coach. If you mess up, guess what? You can talk to the coach. If you're down and you don't think you can do it, the coach will lift you up. We have access to God. That makes it all possible. 
In fact, it closes with a seemingly unusual phrase. Paul says, I ask therefore not for you to be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are your glory. Paul is saying the prize, having access to God, is worth the price. Some believers will have to pay a price. But guess what? The prize is worth the price. The prize of access to God. After we've been saved, He still has a plan for us to glorify Him. And we can do that plan if we have the proper humble posture. If we keep a passion for Him and His gospel to be shared with others. If we take part in His plan to share and to live light even in the midst of darkness because we have access to God, He will glorify Himself through us. And no matter what happens, even if we have to pay the price, God will be glorified. We are an army of God that will succeed because He will help us succeed. All we have to do is stay close to the Father. Okay. God, thank You that You mentioned Your glory, that in Jesus You are glorified. In the end times You will be glorified. Jesus will give glory back to You. That in an amazing step, You tell us that we can give You glory when You lift us up and how we live for You. God, help us to glorify You by how we live for You. And help us know that the source of all that, the power behind that, and the praise of all that is You uplifting us. God, may, may we not lift up ourselves in our own power, but may we have passion for You, a humble spirit, and know that Your power will guide us so that we can give glory to You. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.